So I'm going to read from my book Q&A, which just came out a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, this is a hard book to excerpt. I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to read from this. It's a hard book to set up too, because it jumps all over the place and there's multiple perspectives and there's multiple forms. And um, there's even a lot of shifting kind of typographical uh, features. So I'm gonna do my best to set this up in a coherent way uh, with a quick word on some of the characters. And then also I have these sort of visual aids that might help as I go through the reading uh, to indicate some of the like page layout things, um, which of course can't really be conveyed just by reading aloud. So, uh, and I haven't timed this, but I've erred on the side of being too short rather than too long. Um, but the characters in this section will be uh, a guy named Kenyon St. Clair. He's one of the main characters. Uh, he's a young college professor in New York in the 1950s. He teaches at Columbia, and uh, he's also an aspiring novelist. He's the son of a very distinguished American family. His father is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and a really highly esteemed professor at Columbia. Uh, so Kenyon is very much following in his father's footsteps and sort of caught in his father's shadow in many ways. Then there's another character called Sidney Winfeld. Um, he's sort of a, a working stiff from Queens. Um, and he and Kenyon both end up on the same um, TV game show, a quiz show in the 1950s. And this is based on an actual uh, chapter of American history, the quiz show scandals of the 1950s. Um, Kenyon's gotten wrapped up in this um, and he's been put up against Sydney in a contest on TV. And Sydney, at some point, has been compelled to, to lose the, um, the game to Kenyon in a, in a rigged show. Um, and Kenyon has become complicit in this whole um, secret, which is that the, the shows themselves are rigged. The contestants know all the answers ahead of time. And this is so that the producers of the shows can um, manipulate the drama and maximize the suspense in order to sell products to people during the ad placements, and those are mostly pharmaceuticals. Um, so we have Kenyon, we have Sydney, and then uh, we'll meet briefly two other characters, um, Sam Lackey and Raymond Greenmarch, and they're the producers of this fixed quiz show. I think that's all you need to know about them. Uh, and then I should say a word about the forms real quick here. We'll be in Kenyon's perspective at first, then we'll switch to Sydney's, and then um, there will be a Q&A section. Um, so just as the book's title suggests, there are various points in the book where we lapse into these um, formatted sort of verbatim Q&As uh, where on the page it just says Q-A, Q-A, Q-A. And then the final section will be a very short section called, and now a word from our sponsors, which is one of the other forms in the book that's recurring where we sort of lapse into this like collage of randomized texts that are sort of snippets of commercials and um, other voices just all kind of coming at us at once and piling on top of each other to give this sense of sort of simultaneity and um, a multimedia kind of environment. Um, so that final section, and now a word from our sponsors, even though in the book those are all text sections, I've, I have a little video, so it'll be in video form for you, and hopefully it'll play smoothly. We'll see. All right. So we'll start with Kenyon. Are we seeing Kenyon on the screen now? Okay, so this might work. We'll see. <laughs> all right. There have been rumors and murmurings. For weeks they've been leading up to this, and now here it is flat on Ernestine's desk, the latest edition of Time Magazine. Its cover trimmed in red and white, and there under the stately Roman lettering is his own face, the face of Kenyon St. Clair, framed against a field of patriotic blue. Wired up in bulky black earphones, inclining toward the slender serpent's head of a microphone, he's fixing his gaze on an answer, determined that the answer not elude him, his lips parted to say his line. Above his left shoulder, a legend reads, Quiz Champ St. Clair. And further up in the top corner, a yellow banner says, Brains V Dollars on TV. Kenyon's heart is racing. 
my goodness, do I look like that? First time you've seen it, says Ernestine. Yes. Is he overreacting or is he really short of breath? He feels her watchful eyes as he picks the issue up. I don't remember taking this picture. Is that my face? Would you like a cup of water, Kenyon? When does this come out? Today, I think. L let me get you that water. Suddenly, somehow, the water glass is in his hand and he's still holding the magazine. He hasn't even opened it. He's thinking somewhat irrelevantly how little he resembles his father, despite what people say. Does he really look like this with that face? Whose is it? The story's only a few pages, says Ernestine from somewhere just behind him. In case you were wondering, you're not the whole issue. No? Good. I'm not that important. I'm not this important. He's realizing now how stunned he must look. Mr. Lackey's ready whenever you are. Do you need a minute? He lets the magazine slap down on the desk. He breathes out. Oh, I don't know. No, I, I think I'm ready. Lackey is at his desk, craned forward over another copy of Time open before him. He doesn't look up. Come in, Kenny. I just saw Ernestine's copy. I, I don't remember taking that picture. It's a file photo. These headphones, they're superimposed, see? Don't tell me what it says, okay, Sam? Lackey glances up. It's all good, though. You don't need to worry. I don't want to know. It's great fucking publicity. That's all any of us need to know. Jesus, are you all right? Surprised is all. He's still holding the water glass. He keeps one hand underneath it, his fingers so slick with sweat. Listen, like I keep telling you, make the best of this, Kenny. Enjoy it. Excuse me, Sam, but what do you know about it? Did they ever put your face on the cover of Time magazine? Never been so lucky, no. Do you need a smoke, Kenny? No, no, my, my stomach. I'm sorry to lash out. Don't apologize, I'm sure it's a shock. Let's take a few minutes, why don't we? Just a few minutes to, you know, catch our breath? Okay. Lackey folds the magazine, leans to drop it in a side drawer and trundles the drawer home, click. He lays his head back clasps his hand over his stomach. Buddy, listen, this is the final lap, okay? This is it. One more show and you're done. Done with the isolation booth, photo shoots, these meetings, it's all behind you after that, okay? You've got your gig at NBC, you'll have your winnings, a new kind of life, hmm? Yeah, says Kenyon, sipping from his glass. Yeah, I see that. And I realize I'm terribly lucky. I do, you just wonder, I wonder anyway how much louder it all could get, how to turn the volume down. Maybe you need a getaway, Kenny. You know, once your run is over here, someplace nice, somewhere sunny, treat yourself. Kenyon unbuttons his coat, slips it over the chair back. You need some more water, says Lackey, before we start. They run through the cards, the point sequ sequencing, the mechanics of his loss to Mrs. Dearborn and Kenyon feels better and better by the minute. The final lap, he tells himself, the final lap. Now in the bustle of the streets, his own face confronts him at every newsstand. We, he won't dare try the subway, not today. To see himself multiplied, to be duplicated and propagated and carried in so many briefcases under so many arms, the image itself is oppressively authoritative. Against all reason, the image renders the actual him, the only him, a simulacrum. The image is the truth, and all things conspire to take you out of yourself. In the gray mist, he turns up his collar, tugs his scarf snug, and bores forward down the sidewalk, moving fast, eyes kept low. He is jigged up and distracted. He's got a yearning this morning, a yearning as clear and sharp as any he's ever felt. What he yearns for is the old chaotic freedom of this city, the noise and restlessness, the stony indifference, the constant dangers, the lives in teeming masses all around. Until very recently, he was lost in all that. Always the caverns of Manhattan called up a special resourcefulness. You had to carry somewhere inside yourself an answer to the city's vast anonymity. You did it by striving, 
striving for something exact or for something vague and elusive, but striving all the same. But now, how different to know well beforehand everything that lies ahead. Sydney. May the 6th, and here he is at 667 Madison Avenue, waiting politely in the carpeted lobby outside Green March's office while Green March wraps up some other business. 10 minutes, 15, and not a sound yet from Green March behind those doors, not so much as a, sorry to keep you waiting, Sid, but I'll just be a few more minutes. Which Sidney being expected and all, having an appointment and all, it's not as if he's come barging in here. Well, it puts a bad taste in a fella's mouth. How could it not? Denise, honey, could I have a glass of water? Sure, Mr. Winfield, says the secretary, stepping away from her typewriter to fetch it. And she brings it with a little paper napkin, but no comment such as, he'll be with you very soon, I'm sure. No such thing, nothing at all. So he tells her again, says, I did make an appointment. I'm in his book for today. To this, she returns a small noise, hard to interpret, and sits herself down again. Sydney gulps half the glass full, lukewarm and tastes of galvanized piping. Some days he's dying, Sydney's sure of it, dying quick of some condition with hardly any symptoms at all. Started in the gut, that so-called ulcer, which hasn't gotten worse, but not better either. And he's no hypochondriac. This is the stuff he's talked over to no end with the shrink. Worries like this, they'd sicken just anybody, even the shrink said so, would level most fellas, in fact. But now look at him getting started. Hey, don't start down that road. That road leads no place and you know it. After all, it's not the worries that bring him back to this office. It's the simple fact of certain guarantees having been made, a man's pledge. Ray Greenmarch himself back in February saying, come see me in May, Sid. It's not as if Sidney's here unannounced or uninvited or showing up just to gush out his worries. No, he's in the man's book, which when you're in the book, you deserve the respect. But now the office door bursts open. Sid, there you are. Have you been waiting awfully long? And Sidney's on his feet and pumping Green March's hand, a cold and curiously soft hand. The padding of the palm gives way under your clasp, just sinks like a partly deflated balloon and almost no grip at all in Ray's shake. Have they never shook hands before now? It's possible they haven't. It's just possible, which would explain an awful lot. It's been a frantic afternoon, Sid. This and that, he and she, them and us, but come in, come in, sit yourself down. I've got a few minutes before they rope me back again. The door clicks shut behind them. Greenmarch glides to his desk and sits. You must be finished with your study, Sid. That's right, Ray, I figured you'd remember. Today, in fact, as of today, I'm graduated. Congratulations, how's your wife? Fine, fine, and you remember? I remember, she's expecting. And when's the tyke arrive? Oh, uh, middle of September. That's swell, Sid. I'm sure you're both very happy on that note. We sure are, Ray. Good. Well, Sidney sits ready now, upright and listening, all ears. It ain't for him to broach the subject himself. It's May the 6th after all, and they both know damn well what brings him in. So he levels his eyes across the desk at Green March, at Ray, and waits. Green March runs a hand down his tie leans forward and plants his forearms across the desktop. Well, Sid, as I say, things have been frantic around here and we may as well get down to business, shall we? Yep. Which is to say, Sid, that Mint and Green March has only very recently brokered some deals with NBC. These were major growth opportunities for this office, you understand. Well, that's good news, Ray, that's great, congratulations. You see though, Sid, that the upshot in your particular case, I'm afraid, is an abstention of dealings with regard to quiz show and panel show programming. That's to say, I'm afraid that those opportunities we discussed prior, you and I, I'm afraid it's now out of my hands. Out of your hands. Mm, my hands are tied, in other words. The deal's off, you're telling me. Those particular properties, Sid, the panel and or quiz programs we discussed, they're no longer our property, you see. You sold the shows. We were given the chance to capitalize on these productions and in the interest of growth, we no longer hold creative stake. Tell me in fucking English, Ray, tell me what you did. Look, Sid, it's business, all right? There was a buyer. It's fucking monkey business, Ray. Why don't you tell me that? Sid, I, I can appreciate you're disappointed. 
but Sidney's on his feet already and moving his back to Ray Raymond Greenmarch, his hands already outstretched to fling open the office doors. And though Greenmarch back there at his desk is saying something to the effect of, I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with our liaison at the network, already Sidney's body is wheeling through the corridor, charging onto the elevator, dropping like a meteorite to the street. Already the crush of the sidewalk surrounds him. Already he's moving through the people, the people down here on the ground. And already he knows those promise breakers upstairs are in for it. Those TV guys jerking their levers day and night, thinking they make the world go round one way or another, they're in for it. Mr. Winfield, did you ever see me before today? Never in my life, sir. In other words, the questions and answers you are now giving have not been rehearsed with me? That is correct, sir. And they are truthful? Under oath, sir, I am telling exactly what the story is. If I understand this correctly, you made 10 or 11 different appearances on the quiz program, eight appearances. So that the record will be clear, for each and every one of these eight appearances, you were supplied with the questions and the answers? Yes, sir, from the first to the last. You were in school at the time? Yes, sir, I was a senior at the City College of New York. Were you using the program to obtain financial resources for your education? It's a municipal college, sir. Mainly I wanted to obtain a sort of financial independence from my in-laws, for your in-laws, from my in-laws. A commendable trait, I should say. One thing further, Mr. Winfeld, have you ever at any time had any psychiatric treatment? I have, sir. That was after I left the program, sir. You had none before that? I had never had any before in my life, but I felt, I feel that we all can use some help. I was very nervous during that time. During the period following your interactions with Mr. Greenmarch, is it true that Mr. Greenmarch had control of the program for the other contestants who subsequently appeared? That is correct, sir. Including Mr. St. Clair? That is correct. Mr. St. Clair has built himself up as an intellectual giant in the eyes of the American people and is making a lot of money today thanks to his contract with NBC. Is it reasonable to assume based upon your information that Mr. St. Clair also got the Green March preparation and treatment throughout his time on the quiz program? May I say, sir, I believe you watched the kinescopes and could tell as, as well as anybody the identical actions that I and Mr. St. Clair were making all the time on the program. In other words, patting our brows and biting our lips, et cetera. In other words, sir, I would usually assume that two gentlemen under pressure do not have the exact same patterns when they are nervous. You would say then that Mr. St. Clair was also given the answers? That is, we may say that Mr. St. Clair is also, as you have referred to yourself previously in these hearings, a paid actor. I must leave it for the committee to decide, sir. I am just saying what I know to be factual. Mr. Winfield, as you will understand, the reason I point out Mr. St. Clair is because in the United States, we are concerned about education and salutary standards for our children. Here is a man revered for his presumable knowledge and intellectual capacity. I want to be sure that he is not perpetrating a fraud, you understand, on the American people and the students who look to him as a man with knowledge. I cannot make any accusations when, in fact, he may have been fixed. I can only speak to the facts as I know them to be, sir. Boys and girls, whoever has the magic red crayon, I want you to come on up to the magic window right now. That's right. I am frightened by the imbalance the constant striving to reach the largest possible audience for everything. Golden Fluffle, the first all-new shortening in 40 years. No body politic is healthy until it begins to itch. I would like television to produce some itching pills, rather than this endless outpouring of tranquilizers. Richer looking, better tasting, more appetizing. Neither player inside the studios can hear anything until I turn the studios on with these switches. So I'll turn the studios on right now. The sponsor of an hour's television program is not merely buying the six minutes devoted to his commercial message. He is determining within broad limits 
the sum total of the impact of the entire hour. But let's hear what Mrs. Thelma Styra, Indiana State Fair baking champion, had to say about Fluffo. If he always invariably reaches for the largest possible audience, then this process of insulation, of escape from reality, will continue to be massively financed. I love Fluffo. It makes such a golden brown pie. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable, and complacent. Oh, man, that, that's some apple pie. But unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, those who work at it, may see a totally different picture. Too late. You following right along with me, boys and girls? Just follow my finger. And this will be a very, very big surprise at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You're supposed to clap right there. Right there where you clap. Help us. If we go on as we are, then history will take its revenge, and retribution will not limp in catching up with us. One, two, three, we go. Hopefully that came through clear. I don't know how well that played, but uh, um, so that's what I have. Thank you. <laughs>